So most dads uh, teach their kids, let's say, how to throw a baseball. You taught me um, about the convergence of blockchain, AI, and IoT. So I had a different childhood than other people. <laughs> but the things we didn't talk about is the COVID-19 impact. Organizations were already on digital transformation roadmaps. It just stressed them, accelerated them. Can you show the book again? It looks beautiful. Yeah, this is the, this is the hardback. There is also a, a paperback. Yeah, first of all, the reason I, I don't teach you baseball and other things is I'm not good at it. <laughs> I'm not good at sports. <laughs> if I haven't said it before, buy this book. And I provide this holistic perspective and because this is a very important topic. There are really these three pillars, the digitization, the transformation, the cultural aspect. If you ignore, there is the debt aspect which could cost either you to you as an individual or a company very very dear today's episode is brought to you by lccheeshop.com that's lccheeshop.com and go to lccheeshop.com for all your cheese charcuterie bagels pastries all the different yummy gourmet goods that you could possibly want in the LA area, go to lcgshop.com. Welcome back to another episode of the On With Shahan podcast. Today, I have an amazing guest, okay? You might know him as dad, or I know him as dad, I guess, or Bob or Baba, Dr. Setra Kashafian. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Oh, I have been waiting for this. <laughs> for a long time i'm really looking forward to it it's it's an honor and privilege and it's gonna be a lot of fun i'm looking forward thank you and uh just before we get started what what would you say is your favorite podcast uh the, my favorite podcast is on with shahan especially the one you did with your wife courtney uh, okay it took it took you a while you had a little bit of a pause there so uh just wondering <laughs> So, I didn't expect the question. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I'm so glad to have you. It's long overdue to have you on the podcast. It's a very exciting announcement. I know you have a special background paper on your screen. I want to talk about that. Tell us about this, this new book and uh, how you got started. Yeah, absolutely. This is a very special one, uh, especially when we are in the midst of the, well, I was hoping by this time would have been post COVID-19, post pandemic, but we're still in the middle of it and we, we're struggling. And for a while now, a uh, couple of years, especially last year, uh, I've been looking at the impact the COVID-19 was having, especially on organizations of different sizes small uh, organizations, startups, as well as large enterprises, Fortune 500 companies, and the trends, uh, you know, the, this virtualization and the cultural trends mm -hmm. that were going on. And um, it really inspired, I got inspired from this notion of uh, technical and technology debt. Uh, so, uh, and, and Sean, you've been in technology, you you know, and you have seen it, right? That then you can, yeah. you know, let me know what your thoughts are on this, that uh, when companies, organizations, even individuals ignore uh, the trends and uh, go with easy solutions, right? They accumulate debt. And they accumulate that. Uh, you remember in 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 you know you've been in sales, Sean, and I, I, I like to get your perspective on this also. Uh, you remember we used to have this illustration. It's, it was a cartoon uh, where um, you know a couple of people in the field they have these square wheels and they're really sweating on it. And somebody uh, is coming and selling them a round wheel to make things easier. And they're saying, no, we're busy. <laughs> you know, we're busy, we have work to do. So they're putting much more effort. So that's sort of the uh, technology debt. And now when you deal with digital transformation and we can touch upon what it is, it's much more serious. So, so what do you think of this? 
technology debt. What have you seen, Shahan, yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I've certainly seen that um, in terms of, you know, I, I worked with a lot of media companies, kind of the legacy media, you know, cable, television, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, there'd be so many things you throw out there of like, here's a way to optimize the different ways that you're doing to make life easier, easier for yourself. And they're so focused, I guess, on um, just what they're doing at the time, how they've done something for 30 years that if it if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I've seen I've certainly seen this across all different industries. Question for you on the debt piece and uh, maybe for the audience as well. Do you see when you define debt, do you think it's the debt of not changing things? So you mentioned like the square wheels to the round wheels, you know, don't, don't bother me. I'm busy here. Is de another debt like debt that you might have in terms of all this legacy technology that you might have um, and that because you're not upgrading uh, to new systems or new ways to do things, that's debt that you're carrying over. Could you talk through how you define debt? Oh, that's a great question, Sean. And um, it's really complicated. The, the easy answer is yes, all of the above. Mm. Um, so, so one, when I wrote this book, I was looking at really the notion of transformation using digital technology, but perhaps the most important, one of the most important chapters in the book is culture. A few years back, I did a TEDx talk uh, on how culture is always more, more important than technology. Mm. So transformation implicit in it has this notion of cultural change. And I'll touch upon some of the salient capabilities you need to have in the cultural change, but it's leveraging also digital technology. So digital technologies are enablers. So you, when you talk about debt, you need to look at transformation debt and digital debt, and more importantly, the combination of digital transformation debt. So in terms of the culture, we are seeing incredible trends, especially with the younger generation. They are more entrepreneurial, they're innovative, they don't like corporate structure. I mean, I, I always give this example, uh, and I, you've seen it, uh, Shahan. And I by like the way, you define me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I've known you, and and you know you've been in the corporate, right? And you have yeah. this typical org chart, right? The yeah. org chart, the hierarchy where the decision is at the top. And then you have in the you know button the employees etc who are the touch points with the with the end customers, and this org chart has survived centuries. I, I, I did a research. I saw org charts going way back, and there is a problem with the org chart. And what COVID nineteen did is it accelerated the, through especially virtual meetings the availability between the ver various layers. Not all companies, but we're seeing more openness. We saw more openness of inclusiveness of everybody. And so there is this flattening, flattening cultural trend, okay? With the flattening cultural trend, you have the technology. This is just one example communication technology, sharing technology, automation technology. So the two go hand in hand. And if you ignore it and you keep the structure and you keep business as usual and uh, you know the hierarchy and then the, the power structure and right. do not address innovation and change and this agility and motion terms that we, we always hear about, well, the organization will pay a price. You, you will see uh, many of the, especially younger generation like yourself would leave, would, would not be able to take the corporate uh, culture. So you need to approach it both from the culture's perspective, flattening is one, for, another one is decentralization. Right, we're seeing you, and, and I like to hear. I mean, I've learned so much from you, uh, and you, uh, a lot of your episodes uh, in uh, on which Shahan address it. 
the decentralization. People forget that, uh, the, that blockchain technology, which is the underlying technology of Bitcoin, is really a cultural enabler for decentralization, right? In DeFi versus central banks versus, for example, Bitcoin and other decentralized. What, what are your thoughts, uh, Sean, on this, in the impact of blockchain for decentralization as in, you know, there is even a term for it, like decentralized autonomous organization, but that's really a cultural uh, trend. Do you see it that way, Sean? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how organizations in the future or non-organizations, these DAOs, these decentralized autonomous organizations, because to me, it's like if I'm just looking at myself, like I could work with five, six, seven, eight different companies at the same time and give my skill sets to those organizations because of the way they're designed. It's, it's designed a, a little bit different, non-restrictive in terms of what I need to do. One of the things I hated about working with corporate America is like you said, there is this hierarchy of command and how they do things. And it's just because how it was done before, it doesn't really make sense to be that way. And then, you know, you've been remote, I've been remote. Um, there's so many ways that we can work as a mobile organization. I think there's going to be new organizations um, that arise because of these technological innovations. But before I forget, um, I've asked the last few guests this, and I know this isn't financial advice, but uh, I would just like to know your Bitcoin price prediction by the end of 2021. And I know you don't make price predictions, but do you have a prediction? I'm hoping as a holder of Bitcoin <laughs> that it will get to 50K. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, yeah, it's it's an uh, emotional roller coaster, and I've learned from you to ignore it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, if you, you know, but uh, that, that's a lesson lesson I learned from you. Um, yeah. But I'm hoping 50k. I know you're. What, what do you think? I, mean, I said 100. My, my prediction is 100k. So we'll bet a dinner. So, by the way, I just want to brag. Not many people can say their dad got into crypto in i think like 2017 maybe uh -huh. um so he is a he is a pretty early adopter um he's done uh well for himself got in an early and seen kind of the roller coaster ups and downs um so speaking of that you mentioned uh blockchain you mentioned crypto bitcoin are there other things like these enabling technologies that you look at similarly that like and we'll get to the specifics of your book, but are, what are some other technology areas that you cover? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, such an important uh, question. Before I move that in, into that, Sean, I, I should mention another very important aspect of this culture, and I'll get into the technologies, uh, and that is servant leadership. That is absolutely uh, necessary. The, the pyramid has to be flipped mm -hmm. and uh, leaders in this post COVID-19 era, era should see themselves as facilitators, as delegators, as in people who empower and enable. And I believe the companies that do that will thrive leveraging digital technologies. Now to your question, so, so this is what makes this book uh, quite uh, unique because I spend a lot of time looking at things holistically. So I do cover blockchain uh, technologies, but uh, besides that, uh, I cover deeply uh, this whole notion of automation. You know, if you look and, and, and we saw that, and this is coming big time, um, you know, we're, we're, we've heard of self-driving cars, self-driving trucks. I think the last uh, 60 minutes I had, I had some coverage of it. Uh, they're becoming real. Uh, but then automation, not only in the factory, in manufacturing, in warehousing, or the entire uh, supply chain, and I'll come back to that, which is the biggest challenge, uh, post COVID-19, but automation in the various layers of the worker employee environment uh, in, in through software, software automation, there is a new name for it, robotic process automation. Uh, and it, whether you're 
working in front office, mid office, back office, or without humans, you're accessing multiple systems of record. Uh, automation, I mean, you worked, uh, Shahan, in, in this business process automation, um, and you're very familiar with it. Um, so that's a very important trend. That's one of the pillars, and it's going to have huge impact. And that's why, so what's the debt? Well, the debt is you need to reskill, right? You need to upskill your employees. You need to prepare for them. Mm. You know, many times employees are scared. Am I going to lose my job? Not right. necessarily. You're going to enjoy your job if you have the servant leaders who empower you, who, you know, who are aware of this debt and they do something about it. So give me an example of that. Like, give me an example of like a servant leader and an employee in this particular scenario, for example. Yeah, so so let me use an, another technology. And they imagine that servant leader uh, realizes that instead of repetitive work, I can leverage at least some of my employees who are interested for them who are, for instance, have these constant interactions with customers, and they've always asked for certain features in their in their solution, they, whether you know, they're doing customer service, opening accounts, whatever they're doing in any field, you have touch points. It could be customers, it could be partners, et cetera. And they're said, I wish I could do that, et cetera, rather than doing this, you know, copying information from one system, this routine, which will be replaced by software robots, as well as hardware robots in some right. cases. So what if they upskill them and say, look, there is this new trend of citizen developers. You are the citizen. I'm going to enable you and I'm going to have you get training on a no-code platform. And, and I'm going to empower what's, you. What's, what's a no-code platform for those that don't know? Okay, great question. So... Um, Programming languages have had an evolution. I myself have been a professor in, in you mentioned books. I've written a book, for example, on object orientation. Uh, I've written about more than 10 books. Uh, this is my last one, um, latest one rather. Um, yeah, I, and, I'm, I'm sure this isn't going to be your last one, but yeah, go ahead. That's true. <laughs> Actually, the next one I want to write is on local book. <laughs> okay, let's, we got to promote this book first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Keep me honest. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I, although I developed, uh, I, I de dedicate a chapter on citizen developer as well as citizen data scientist. We'll, we'll come to that uh, within the book. Um, so the what is uh, no code, low code? Uh, first of all, these two terms are often used interchangeably. Um, you know, to keep things simple for this podcast. Um, it's just low code, you might do some coding, whereas no code, it's entirely a citizen developer. So, so as I was saying, programming languages have had an evolution. So we started with like machine language, assembly language, and then uh, we went to structured language like C, Pascal, et cetera, to object oriented. And every time we changed the paradigm, we had more productivity. Mm -hmm. That is produce more business logic for the same amount of time. That's I mean, just keeping it very simple. But you always had this silo between business and IT because business would have, and you're familiar with this, John, business would write the requirements, throw it over the wall, and then let IT do the development using one of these structured or prog object-oriented programming languages. And there are so many of them. It's ridiculous. I mean, there are hundreds of languages and still new ones. are. And they all look the same, cryptic. You have to understand the syntax, the terms, etc. Now, the revolution that has happened recently, and we've seen some of this in other applications. For example, you're a user, Sean, of PowerPoint, right? An mm -hmm. Excel spreadsheet, right? And Word. You know, you, you you don't go and and you know we used to have that right. <laughs> Somebody used to take down a, a secretary the the notes and go and type it. You know, no, we don't do that. We use word processors, etc. So the regular, the citizen, the regular user uses these productivity tools, whether it's PowerPoint or 
you know, Word or Excel, etc. Well, why can't we do that with web applications or mobile applications? Why don't we empower the people? I was giving you the example, you know, we're talking about upskilling, right? The, of the employee who's doing this, you know, copying and doing the very routine works. And if they don't do something about it, they're going to lose their job to robots, software robots. Same right, with physical right. robots. So to upskill means that servant leader, coming back to your question, which is very important, the servant leader now does training and empower and enables those employees who knew the pain points of their customers, the most important target of any organization, to come up with business logic, to come up even with simple applications, et cetera. And that's revolutionary because if, we, if you don't do this and if you're an organization, you're not doing it, you're accumulating debt. And here you see the transformation, the upskilling and empowering of the employee and the digital, which is the no-code platform. So what is a no-code platform? It's like very easy to use, visual, drag and drop, and build applications. Sort of think of it as PowerPoint. You have shapes in PowerPoint. Imagine you do that and, the, and then you apply and, and run it as a program capturing some sort of a business logic of what the citizen developer, that customer service representative, for example, has learned as pain points from their customers or requests from their customers. So it's a, it's a long answer, but it really tells you, you know, uh, enable the employees to address the needs of the customers of the organization. Very simple, right? How do you enable them? empower them to develop web applications and mobile applications. That sounds revolutionary, but that's the trend. That's where we're going. Just as business stakeholders and business users are using productivity tools, why can't they build web, app web applications and mobile applications? Anybody. This is actually having a profound impact for startups. You know, you, you are in that world, <laughs> Sean, and I like to hear your your perspective as well. Is this making sense? Is low code, no code in the startup world? Uh, mean, there's a term for it: minimum viable product, right? So imagine you're an expert and you have such a tool that you yourself can build a minimum viable uh, product. What do you think, yeah. Sean? Yeah, I think that was just spot on. I mean, uh, even what you said about you know, if you don't have servant leaders that are providing these tools to their employees for them to empower themselves within those organizations you're taking technology debt you're also taking i mean the the employees also taking on debt too because if they're not upskilling um they're going to be kind of stagnant and i think that's the reason why you're seeing at least, you know, I could speak for my generation, I guess, or like the millennials, I guess, of why we're more empowered. Like, for example, I have all the technology here with my mic and the streaming and all of that with Zoom to do pretty much what an organization does on my own, right, as an independent person, because I'm enabled by all these different technologies. So I think I'm curious to get your thoughts of like, how much trouble are traditional organizations in with this new paradigm shift? Because I think the barriers to entries to starting a business, to starting your own podcast, to doing stuff in media, to writing your own book and independently publishing that too, all these different things are empowering. So what happens to organizations? You, do you see this hierarchy in the way that organizations are built today, like crumbling down? That's a great question. I, it will take time. Look, legacies have survived. I mean, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there are people who still uh, there. There's COBOL programming. It's a very old language. The other day, I heard people were looking for Lisp programmers. I hadn't heard about Lisp, which is an artificial intelligence functional programming language, for a long time. And they survive. They survive. Legacies um, have some resilience, but Great point. Uh, disruption also happens. Uh, disruption also happens, and and we are seeing it uh, in in many dom domains. Um, and you also like to keep your employees happy, right? Even if you can survive through through maintenance mode, let us say, 
uh, you like a more thriving environment with, with your employees because if your employees are happy again coming to the transformation the culture they will your customers will will be happier so we're gonna it's gonna take a while and they, these are not the only technologies by the way uh, Sean there are others uh, which are very very uh, important um, for example uh, we you have technologies for connected things and connected devices, IoT, uh, it's really exploding. L look at, uh, you know, I, I give this example. I used to go to these uh, retailers uh, like Best Buy's and uh, others, and uh, you know, several years ago they had few um, Internet of Thing, you know, for the home uh, environment, um, you know, cameras, etc. Right. Over time, and all of them, like staples, all of them, over time, the shelf space is exploding. And now you cannot think of a home which doesn't have connected devices. Well, that also applies to manufacturing, mm -hmm. applies to supply chain, applies to uh, various types of a almost any industries. Telehealth. Okay, here, here's an example in the COVID area. There was an explosion of telehealth during COVID-19 for obvious reasons, right? You, you, can, you can visit with your nurse or your doctor over a Zoom session. So every single sector of the industry, these are Internet of Things, is impacted with connected devices. So it's becoming a connected world and it's becoming a decentralized world. So these are two of the technologies. They're not the only one. I mentioned citizen um, developers, but there is also something called citizen data scientists, a little bit much less um, known than citizen uh, developers because it's relatively new. But imagine you have now the ability to address the the a very difficult problem of, you know, we're generating enormous amounts of data, right? Everybody's generating enormous amounts of data. People are generating, look at look at social networking, how many tweets and posts, et cetera, is happening on the social media. And then add to that the internet of things and all the transactional data that you have in enterprises. So we have an explosion of, of data. Well, that's, data it's not knowledge it's not actionable knowledge so there are these technologies again transformational and digital we always come for the digital transformation that you need uh, you know one of the things that, and i've seen it in many organizations that i felt that they they express that we are accumulating all this data we're hurting uh, you know the, the, a lot of data but uh, we're not benefiting from it right uh, so so what you need to do is apply data cleansing and then um, you know data aggregation and then apply algorithms to mine various models there is data mining there's also process mining what really happened with your processes for example your procurement processes order to cash processes what happened you can mine and you see what was the most common and what are all the exceptions and then how you can improve this and your optimize your, your processes through automation. So that is also becoming easier and easier for organizations to do. And so another one of these technologies, if they are willing to do the transformation, is uh, data science, the citizen data scientists so that not only you accumulate uh, all this data, but uh, not hoarding just the data, but also aggregating it and then uh, gaining insight and then do action, taking action from the insight to action through uh, you know, these low-code, no-code uh, platforms. And then you continuously you know, monitor and improve. So that's another, this whole, and AI is of course part of it, machine learning, uh, predictive analytics, all these uh, natural language processing are part of it. So I've dedicated a chapter on that uh, as well and how they interact. You know, I gave you an example of how now you have 
the accumulation of the data, that technology, the aggregation, and the gaining the insight, and then from the inside going to low code, no code. So one of the reasons I wrote uh, the books, there are many, but one of them is that today the world is very complicated, both from a transformational and a cultural aspect, as well as a technology aspect. You have to have a holistic view. You have, it's not enough just to focus, for example, on gaining the insight. Okay, you gain the insight, what do you do with it? You need the low-code, no-code platform to automate what you harvested what you gained what you understood what you discovered from this data and then automated in the context of web applications and mobile uh, applications so so all these are also pillars uh, of technology that I, that, that I address and also from the transformational perspective uh, you know when you look at an enterprise whether it's a startup or a, or an incumbent organization they need to be constantly innovating. They need to be constantly disrupting themselves. So I also cover methodologies uh, like uh, design thinking and design sprint. And you have some experience with it, Sean, yeah. um, that where you can think big, think digital transformation and starting small leveraging that methodology. So the transformation has this methodology aspect for it of it and the digital has all these technologies from you know low code no code platform process automation uh, IoT and and blockchain and AI and others if i haven't said it before buy this book there are so many good nuggets in this book um so many things that you different co uh, that you cover here um so i had a question for you so most dads uh teach their kids let's say how to throw a baseball uh you taught me um, about the convergence of blockchain, AI, and IoT. So I had a different childhood than other people. But I, I had a question. So we're different ages, but you know just as much about, if not way more than me, about new uh, upcoming technologies. Um, so this is, this is a question for people of all different ages. How do you keep up to date on all this stuff? Like, what do you do like to keep up to date? Because Sometimes you say stuff like you were asking me about NFTs last week, and I'm just like, how do you keep up to date with so many different things? Like, what's your secret to that? And how do you stay on top of these things? Yeah, first of all, the reason I, I don't teach you baseball and other things is I'm not good at it. <laughs> I'm not good at sports. <laughs> I was when i was younger you know like they they form teams and they select the different people i was always last i mean i <laughs> i was the pt selection the last one left they have to take me you know so so that's the reason picking, but they're picking you first for the companies now so uh yeah. <laughs> and and um, well i mean it's almost like uh uh, taking my own medicine, right? I, I, as an individual, if I don't do that, I don't, I, and I try to keep myself uh, always fresh, always educate myself. I will have digital transformation depth myself as an individual. I mean, so that's a great point uh, that, that you're making that it's not just the corporations. Each one of us should ask ourselves, uh, what are the digital technologies which are coming? What are the transformation in my own life? Mm -hmm. So I have the discipline of constantly keeping track uh, of the various trends in, and even thinking about how are these gonna be put together and what are the uh, hottest trends uh, that are gonna uh, impact, impact me personally, or I can help uh, and educate others. And that's one of the main reasons I, I write books. It's really education. I, I'm also an educator. Uh, as I said, I've been a professor adjunct as well as I've done full-time for many years. And I enjoy that tremendously. I really enjoy, especially the younger generation thinking uh, out of the box. You know, I, I've said this and I see this with humility. I met uh, younger people who are older than me, if you know what I mean. And, and uh, I've had met older people who are much younger than the youngest generation, right? You, you have, it's all in your mind. You have to right. keep on. And, and this industry is moving extremely fast. It's accelerating. One of the things we didn't talk about is the COVID-19 impact. 
core organizations were already on digital transformation roadmaps. It just stressed them, accelerated yeah. them. I mentioned supply chain several times. I've been spending quite a bit. I've wrote many blogs and, and a white paper I just recently wrote is going to come up soon. Uh, so look at the problems we are having in supply chain. I mean, we had it during the COVID-19, right? Sanitizers, uh, cameras, and other things. We ran out. But now it's continuing. And this is one of the biggest trends in terms of impact in all industries, whether it's manufacturing, like Intel is being uh, affected by, by supply chain challenges. Um, the price of Tesla is going up because of supply chain challenges. Uh, price of food, um, you know, it's known that even before COVID-19, a considerable percentage of food gets spoiled in the supply chain because of inefficiencies. So the, in the, in the entire world is paying a digital transformation debt because of supply chain. And there are so many vulnerabilities, political vulnerabilities, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, you know, all kinds of disruptions, competition, and all kinds of disruptions that are happening uh, in, in the supply chain and challenging it and stressing it. So these technologies like blockchain is, is an ideal. I mean, if you ask me what is the killer application for blockchain outside cryptocurrencies, I would say, and even in cryptocurrency, is supply chain right. because it gives you end-to-end -end visibility, the provenance as they talk about, uh, and you know where things are coming from, etc. It's not the end uh, solution, but you also need internet of things to trace, uh, you know, through geo uh, location positioning, all of these come together. And then, and then you need low code, no code to have a platform where you can monitor. I even introduced a term for it, um, value stream as a service, value stream where the supply chain is a value stream. You know, there's a, a wonderful lesson that we can learn from uh, process optimization. A theory of constraints. A chain is as strong as the weakest link. Let me repeat it. A chain is as strong as the weakest link. And supply chain is a chain. So even though you might have siloed optimization and enhancement in the multi-tier, there are often many suppliers, there are suppliers of suppliers from the raw material all the way to the consumer, through retail to the consumer with warehousing, logistics, manufacturing, etc. So you, 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 that chain is as strong as the weakest link. So if you have vis visibility and analysis of that entire chain through using things like process mining, blockchain, et cetera, and internet of things and low code, no code, I'm giving you an AI, of course, through machine learning, you can optimize the entire chain. You can even predict uh, and, and you have, can have strategies. That, in my opinion, has not happened yet. Think about it, the most vulnerable area of the world in every industry, supply chain, has it's just in the beginning of being optimized, still local optimization versus end-to-end -end optimization. How do you see it, Sean, uh, this supply chain? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, um, I think to your point, supply chain for blockchain specifically, and, and the point you made about the chain is as strong as its weakest link. Um, I, I think that's certainly true. And then like with blockchain on top, you know, using, utilizing blockchain through the transparency and the audit trail you see um, from blockchain, it's such an enabler technology, at least to, to see what's going on and then to optimize those different processes um, as you see different bottlenecks um, through that. So I had a question, who is this book for? Walk me through like, hey, it's for X person because of this. It's for Y person because of this. Um, and maybe there's some general theme for everybody. But curious from you, uh, like, who did you write this book for? That's a great question. And, and some of it is reflected in the titles of the uh, chapters. Uh, so, so for example, uh, definitely it's for citizen uh, developers, for, for people who um, say, okay, there are these trends, I want to improve myself and, and be current in this transformative world using digital technologies like low-code, no-code. In, in general, um, I would like to see uh, business leaders uh, as well as you know, uh, not only subject matter experts in, in, in business at all levels in, in the 
you know, management level, in VP level, even CEO levels. I like them to see this, uh, this book as a, almost like a prescription, a roadmap for transformation. So, so I, I, I'm making this distinction. Regular users who like to improve themselves, be aware of what's going on culturally and technologies, etc. It's a very easy. I've used a lot of illustrations and kept it easy. If you buy the ebook, I recommend you buy both the hard and and the ebook. I mean, there's a paperback and and uh, the the hardback. Uh, but the uh, uh, ebook, uh, which is on Kindle, on Nook, etc., it's everywhere. It's, uh, Google, um, you you can have the references. You can click on the references. So I, I try to keep it very palatable for everyone. But to answer your question, uh, I am tar- targeting decision makers, whether they are in the business side or the IT side. But I'm, I'm also targeting the citizens, the regular citizens who need these day, days to be available. You ask me the question, how do you keep up? Well, that this is how, you know, you have to be aware of this because these are impacting our lives. We need to constantly reskill and upskill to keep up and be relevant in, in our job situations, in our fulfillment, right? Uh, you were talking about the millennials, Sean. I mean, I like, <laughs> I, I think you should share more about your experience, how you, you got out of the corporate mentality. It's really a transformation that I see in, in you, and, and I'm very proud of that. And what you have achieved, especially in the crypto world, and your, how you're helping other organizations, you know, pay the digital transformation that through NFT and other technology. So the, to give it short, both the, the business leaders, IT leaders, as well as the regular citizens. And, and that's how I, I did it. Like it's very holistic, it starts with culture and ends with competency center. It's like methodology. And in between it covers all the essential. There are certain areas we, we, we didn't touch uh, upon like operational excellence, customer experience optimizations. They're all in there and they're covered uh, in the book. And it gives you a good perspective and also with the references allows you to go deeper. So so question on, um, so, cause you have a good kind of view and vision of the future and uh, because you keep up to date with stuff. So if somebody wanted to upskill now or um, was looking to transition into a particular field, um, you cover a lot of different topics here, but what are some, like if somebody was looking to reduce some of the debt, either for themselves or for the organizations. What are some areas you think that are really hot right now? Maybe there's a few of them that people should really look into. Yeah, that's a great question. And we touched upon it. I would say the top one to start with uh, is uh, low code, no code. Uh, it's, it's, I think everyone, you know, there could was- you give, trend- Could you give some examples of some no code, low code yeah. platforms? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, and in fact, uh, there uh, I wrote two articles on Venture Beat. So, if you go to, uh, and and I'll make uh, sure to post those links in the description. Yeah, that that will be very very helpful. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, and and I keep myself fresh uh, myself. Um, the no cut no cut itself. So so let's let's talk about you know the reality, right? I don't want this thing to be just hype. There is not not one thing. It's a very fragmented uh, area, and, and that's why I, I'm also establishing a practice, called, a company called Hosh Consulting. You know, kudos to you, Sha, uh, that um, is trying to help organizations navigate this or individuals. Um, so, like Bubble is, is an envir- uh, is an example um, of a low code, no code platform. They recently got a uh, hundred million dollar uh, venture, wow. and you can relatively easily uh, build a web application. I mean, and then there is a difference between building uh, like Squarespace uh, mm-hmm. if you just want to build a website. That's another example. Right. And so these are, and, and then uh, like even wanna, a, would this be a good example? Like just creating an Eventbrite event that's technically no yeah. code uh, development. Yeah, just just yeah. don't get caught up on. I know if you're new to this and hearing this, like no code could be very simple things. It's just like you're not coding, 
and it just like like uh like you said it was just drag and drop things or just write little descriptions and change yeah. different fields and sliders and different things like that yeah and and i don't mind i mean you can give my e email address people i mean start with the venture beat articles i would recommend you start with the book uh because it gives you a holistic perspective and in fact we have been there before i i worked more than 20 years in what is called business process management you've used <laughs> your work uh several years yourself uh sean and we used to call it model-driven development environment. What does it mean? Rather than writing code, you build models, like models in, in case of business process management, flowcharts. You draw the flowchart and you run the flowchart. And the flowchart starting starts assigning tasks to humans, et cetera. It runs, it's an application. You know, and you can trace it. You do business activity monitoring. Who has the, you know, the approval? Who has it, etc. That's a low-code, no-code platform. So, so we've had this for a while. Uh, there, there are other technologies, interactive development environment, etc. But what we saw with model-driven development is that you're actually, uh, you know, designing modeling a system that runs, that executes rather than generates code and you have to deal with the code. So that's that. So we have had some history in business process management, um, you know, basic, basically workflows where, which assigns tasks to humans, or there are also automated uh, workflows that just go and grab data from systems of record, you know, back office systems and reconcile them and update them, et cetera. So providing you this end-to-end -end capability so it's very important that um, you know you look at whether you're designing a simple website, whether you're de designing a business process, you're doing AI. Now there are low code, no code. One area I think it's still <laughs> relatively weak, and you and I have discussed it. And I like your perspective because you're much more of an expert than I, I am. Is in the low code, no code for blockchain. I, I think that's very important. So the, almost any domain, right? Whether you're doing integration, uh, you know, you're doing web application, mobile application, there is low code, no code, and some of these uh, platforms can do multiple. I also include AI in that. I also include data science and blockchain and IoT. IoT I, again, relatively weaker uh, in in IoT, but there are some uh, platforms, and I touch upon all of this in the book and, and, and the two, two articles I, I, you're gonna post. Uh. So, um, so I'll, just, I'll just make these comments and then, and then I want to ask you where we can buy the book. Um, this book is very unique because um, uh, I know you're my dad, but like your unique experience of all of the different areas you've touched and all the different industries that you've touched whether that's from manufacturing to media to financial services to healthcare, and then the way you looked at things was from a business process management perspective. So it was how process supply chains across the organizations. I mean, you've really seen it. and this book what it does really well. And you mentioned this: we have this crazy event, this pandemic that happens that accelerates the timeline for mm -hmm. a lot of these technologies to be adopted. And I'll just say that I think you're you're unique in that I don't think anyone else could have written this book um, given your experiences. So I think it's an amazing book. And for that reason, I think you have to buy it because the nuggets in it are so good and so unique to Dr. Setrog, dad, Bob, Baba story um, <laughs> that, uh, that I think it's a voice that you really need to hear. So where can we find this book? Where can we buy this book? Is it digital? Is it physical? I saw you. Can you show the book again? It looks beautiful. Yeah, this is this is the hardback. There is also a, a paperback. Okay. And uh, to your question, you can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Google. If you go to Amazon, you have the Kindle version. And uh, you know you have the paperback and you have the hardback, and I recommend you you have both um, because you you might like to navigate the references through the ebook. But I also, you know, I'm old timer. I like I like to read a book. You know, I, I I mean ebooks are nice. I look at ebooks. This is myself. Everybody's different. 
more like references and, and I want to copy something, etc. Uh, click on the reference. I've done it. I spend a lot of time make sure within the text as well as in the reference sections, they're all clickable. And uh, but the book, you know, you sit down and, and read the book, take, you know, the underline things like that. I mean, all timer. Uh, so, but you have you have it over. It's ubiquitous. Um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Google, you, you have it and other channels uh, as well. And, and I'm, it's, I'm it's sure available worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you. And I, I'm sure that a lot of people are going to want to engage with you if their organization is looking to reduce their, their debt. So uh, is there a website or something that somebody yeah. could reach you at in order to, to contact you? Yes. Hoshconsulting.com. Hoshconsulting.com. And kudos to you, Shahan. <laughs> you came up with that name and perspective. And uh, and so my my email address is setrak at hoshconsulting.com. Uh, you can that's my first name, uh, and you can contact me. That's exactly you know I've done throughout my career uh, different types of workshops. I do I, I continue to do uh, consulting um, and any type of organization from startup to technology organizations to you know in any vertical. Um, you know, whether it's manufacturing, telco, um, I, I've been involved in it. Uh, in, and, and I provide this holistic perspective. And if there are, you know, other technologies, I, mean, I can make the recommendations uh, where to go. Because this is a very important topic. Um, uh, the digital transformation, these two aspects. I mean, there are really these three pillars, right? There, there is the digitization. What are the digital technologies exploding? Um, the, the transformation, the cultural aspect. And then if you ignore, there is the debt aspect, which could cost either you to you as an individual or a company very, very dearly. I mean, there are uh, you know, many of the companies who are in the Fortune 500 list today, they will not be there a few years from now. Yeah. And we've seen it. I mean, yeah. there, there are stats that show you that companies that did not innovate, did not disrupt themselves, did not survive. That's not just uh, nice talk or <laughs> hype. That is reality. So that's why I wrote the book. It, 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 it has an implication for each one of us as individuals, we need to be aware of all of this. So I try to keep it simple, uh, but I gave the references in, my, in case there is an area you like to go uh, deep, but also it has an implication for business leaders, wherever they are, um, you know, whether it's on the subject matter, on an executive side or the IT side, that this book can be very, very helpful to them. How to alleviate digital transformation debt post COVID-19, Dr. Setra Kashafian. I'll say this, I love you. Uh, it's so amazing to say, to see this. I mean, you do so many books that we almost like brush it off. Like, oh, you just wrote another book or something like that. It's, it's honestly unbelievable. You're such an accomplished author, such accomplished uh, professional. And uh, we're definitely gonna have round two, three, four, five, six, et cetera on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, before, I also should say, subscribe to On With Shahan. I think it's what Shahan has done, the, the type of guests he's had and the, the way he presented, it's second to none. I would like, I hope and pray this On With Shahan just, just explodes. Uh, and I strongly recommend uh, the On With Shahan podcast. And Shahan, I'm very proud of you. I've learned so much from you. And you and, and Courtney, you guys are doing amazing. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Buy the book. Buy the book. Thanks, guys.